Welcome to week five. We are going to be going over two PowerPoints today, so we're just going to jump right into those. So you should be able to find these in the course. The first one is going to be on myeloproliferative disorders. I have to say it's probably one of my very favorite chapters in the entire hematology book. I know that might sound weird, but I just find myeloproliferative a little bit more fun to teach on. They're a little simpler if you really know their key characteristics to figure them out. Um, but that's just my view on them. So we're just going to go through, skip through those objective slides. You can always read through those later and just get into this. So basically what a myeloproliferative disorder is, is something is getting overly produced. So as the definition states here, it's some sort of stem cell disease with expansion, excessive production, and or overaccumulation of one of the cell lines. It could be all three cell lines are getting overly produced or one of those cell lines is getting overly produced. At any rate, that is a myeloproliferative. It's an increase in the proliferation. Now, it's myelo, meaning we're staying on the myeloid side of the stem cell chart. So if you go back to that chapter seven, you know, everything starts with a hematopoietic stem cell, and then that split into two different stem cells. We had the myeloid stem cell and the lymphoid. We're staying on the myeloid side. So the myeloid stem cell broke down eventually to become either red cells, um, platelets, or the granulocytes and monocytes. The only thing on the lymphoid side was, again, lymphocytes. So we're not too focused on the lymphocytes here with these disorders. They're myelo, meaning all on the other side of that. And then one of those cell lines is overly produced. So they do share very similar clinical and lab features all together. There's only going to be four one that I'm going to ask that you know. There are humans in the category. Um, I know there's another hematology textbook that lists more than just four, but we're just focusing on four. And they are chronic disorders. So again, I just want to keep reminding the difference with acute and chronic, besides the length of time and the progression, acute is very sudden, a much more significant and powerful disease. Chronic can last over time, like the name sounds, but the other difference in lab-wise is the cells that are involved. Acute will have those blast cells, a lot of blast cells, usually greater than 20% are blast cells. That makes an acute condition when you have those really young cells. The chronic, you may see one or two, but you can see that many. It's definitely less than 20 um, You can have other immature cells, but you're not going to have those really young blast cells there. So that's like hematology-wise, that's a big difference is how many blast cells are involved. So chronic, not very many. Acute, a lot more. All right, so these are the four that we are going to learn in this chapter. So we have CML, polycytemia vera, essential thrombocytemia, and myelofibrosis. So again, we will learn what is being overly produced in each one of these to make it a myeloproliferative disease. So we will start with that CML. So CML stands for chronic myelogenous leukemia. The great news about healthcare is, of course, we love to triple name things. So you, you're going to see that middle word slightly altered. It's the same leukemia, though. So you could know it as one chronic myelogenous. You could see it listed as chronic myeloid leukemia. You could see it listed as chronic granulocytic leukemia. All three are the same thing, CML, at the end of the day. So this is a chronic leukemia, but there is at a point in the patient's disease cycle that it could all of a sudden turn into an acute leukemia. At that point, it's a much severe, much more severe prognosis for the patient, and it's not going to, it's not doing so well. But overall, the clinical features we're going to see. Frequent susceptibility to infections, anemia, prone to bleeding, and splenomegaly. You're actually, you're going to find splenomegaly, which is an enlargement of the spleen. You'll see that in all four of these diseases. So all four will have splenomegaly. All right, lab-wise, this is all about overproduction of the granulocyte lines. So the neutrophil, the basophil, and eosinophil lines. So that is why it's a myeloproliferative. We're overly producing those three cell lines. So you're going to see neutrophilia with all stages, meaning an increase in neutrophil count, but you're also going to see band neutrophils heavily increased, metamyelocytes, myelocytes. So those are all going to definitely be found there. What we call that left shift will definitely be present. You'll also see an increase in basophils and eosinophils. Not very often we get an increase in basophils. 
So those also can be seen here. So basically all those granules are heavily increased. You may even get some platelet increase here, um, some thrombocytosis as well. Basically who gets affected is mainly older adults, typically more men than females. Remember, we've already learned this two weeks ago, I want to say, but basically that whole Philadelphia chromosome is kind of what triggers CML to start. So 95% of the time, people do have this chromosome, and that's what initiated them ending up with CML. So it's that whole oncogene fusion. So when BCR and ABL oncogenes fused together, they created this translocation. And that translocation was between chromosomes 9 and 22. And that jump-started this whole process of overly producing these granulocytes and, you know, at this whole leukemia beginning. So keep that in mind with the Philadelphia chromosome between chromosomes 9 and 22. All right, so there is basically kind of what the peripheral blood results would look like. Again, a lot of times there is an anemia with this because these granulocytes are being so overly produced. There's not that many red cells in the bone marrow. They're kind of crowding out the red cells. So the red cells could be anywhere normal to decrease. It just depends on what stage you're at with it. Total white count, very much increased. We're really kicking out those granulocytic cells. So we're really jumping up that white count. Again, it's a high white count. It's often you see it around 100. It's crazy. Um, lymphocytes. We're not really that worried about lymphocytes in this. This is mostly to do with granulocytes. So that's where you see the neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, all three increase. Again, we're going to see some of those immature neutrophils like myelocytes, metamyelocytes, bands would all be increased. Platelets, normal to increase here. And then that lab score. We've already learned the lab score with our stains. But remember, lab score will help be one of the ways to diagnose this or to at least kind of know what's going on. And it would be a decreased lab score. So those are the main peripheral blood results in the bone marrow, huge cellular, hypercellular bone marrow, if you will. Again, all because of the granulopoiesis, the granulocyte development and production is increased. Um, again, erythropoiesis, they don't have a lot of room to get produced in here, so that tends to get lower, which results in their anemia eventually. So like I said at the beginning, this chronic leukemia can all of a sudden go into an acute accelerated phase. We will know when this happens by the blast count because on those other things, we don't talk about blast because blast aren't really a big finding here. But if this is starting to go into an acute leukemia, your blast count will rise. And so the minute the blast counts are higher than 20% of the cells in your bone marrow, if they, out of all the cells in your bone marrow, blast cells are at least 20% or more, that is diagnostic for now you are in an acute leukemia. And once they're in acute Acute leukemia, again, the prognosis for that patient is quite low. They're not going to do very well. So that's kind of just the info there. So here is what it would look like on 10x for your blood. Look at all those white cells. Oh, my gosh. And then here's what it would look like on 100x. Look at all those white cells in one field. I tell you, that white cell count is like 100. It's crazy. I mean, it's like at first you're like, you don't even need that many fields to count 100 cells, but it's hard because these are just easy little normal cells at the time. So when I look at this, you have, I'm hoping you can see my pre -cur my cursor. I say that every time. I don't know. I should watch and make sure. Um, the cell right here that I'm circling around that's on the upper left corner here, that's a nice band. Look at beautiful band shape there, nice C. Below that would be a seg. Below that big one would probably be a myelocyte. Below that would be another seg. You got some other myelocytes here. You can tell they're a lot larger. Their nucleus is tending to be a little bit flattened on one side. You got another band there. Band, sag, sag, band. You see it. Oh, there's a basophil there sitting kind of a little bit above the center. You see those dark purple granules. And actually, there's another basophil squished in here down by this band and sag. So that's two basophils in one field. Never get to see that, do you? So you can tell it's a lot of those granulocytes being produced. And you really got to know your cell identification. Here's another look. You see one, two, three basophils just in this view alone. And then lots of SEGs. And it looks like we have a metamyelocyte over here. You know it's a meta because, again, it has that kidney bean-shaped nucleus, whereas a SEG will be a lot more 
um, of a C or U shape. So the indentation is the key. If the indent isn't quite half the cell, then it's more of a meta. If it goes more than half the cell of an indent to make it a C or U, then it's a band. So just kind of band versus meta is always a little trickier, but um, when it just slightly starts to dip in and make more of that kidney bean shape, that's more of the meta. And then here's that bone marrow. So again, very hypercellular. You're going to notice there's very few fatty patch white areas. It's mostly just cells. All right, so that's CML. Please know those key characteristics of what we see in the lab to diagnose CML. All right, polycythemia vera, or PV for short, also arises from kind of an abnormal hematopoietic stem cell. Again, in this case, you're definitely going to see that splenomegaly, like I see. You always see splenomegaly in all four of these. Also hepatomegaly, so an increase, or enlarged, I should say, liver. Um, now, the key with polycythemia vera, and we're going to go to see what's going to be overly produced here, is these cells are very sensitive to erythropoietin hormone. Remember, that erythropoietin hormone is what helps us develop our red cells. So if they're really sensitive to it, you know that they're going to be overly producing red cells because it's just really getting them going. So that's kind of what we see is those increase in erythrocytes. That's a huge finding with polycythemia is increased in erythrocytes, but it's an increase in everything really. So we'll not only see increased erythrocytes, but you also see increased granulocytes and increased platelets. So when you go up to the name of the disease, polycythemia, and if you know your medical terminology, this will help. Poly means many, cytes, the CYT part means cell. Anemia is blood. It tells you there's many cells in your blood, many blood cells. So I always just say this, the easiest way to remember the key findings with polycythemia is everything is increased. Everything. So red cells, granulocytes, platelets are all increased. When you go to the bone marrow, it's panmylosis, meaning again, all those cell lines are increased. Now your red cells are still a nice normal size. They're normal size, normal chromic. Um, you'll see the mature granulocytes. You don't get any immature cells here. It's all mature cells. They're just all heavily increased with their numbers. The morphology of them all are okay, though. With that being said, because you have so many red cells being produced, it naturally increases your hemoglobin levels and your hematocrit levels because you have so many red cells. So it's very common to see a huge increase in hemoglobin and hematocrit. So again, splenomegaly, we already mentioned that earlier. You will see a lot of oxygen saturation. Well, that's because you have a lot of cells bringing in oxygen. So again, thrombocytosis, leukocytosis, increased lab score. If you were to do a lab score, you'd see that increase here. I mean, so again, everything is up. Let's look at it. Look down that row of changes for both blood and bone marrow. Everything is high. That's easy, right? So that's all you have to remember for polycythemia is when you get like a case study and you're looking at like, oh, let's look at your white cell count, your platelet, your red cell count, they're all high. Let's look at the cells involved. If all the cell lines are increased but they're normal, they're not the immature cells, it's a good sign of polycythemia vera. Your hemoglobin high, that's also a really big sign. The only thing, and I want to be careful so we make sure we understand this, the only thing that is not increased is erythropoietin. I said earlier that these cells, these red cells are extremely sensitive to erythropoietin to help them get produced and grow, but that doesn't mean we have an extra amount of erythropoietin. They're just very sensitive to its effect. So all the cell line stuff is increased, hemoglobin increase, all that, but the erythropoietin level is still normal. So I just wanted to make sure that was well understood. Um, this disease can also progress and begin to show other signs of it furthering. It could get fibrosis involved, um, teardrop-shaped cells, but again, that would be as the disease progresses. One of the ways to treat this disease um, that is done is to do therapeutic phlebotomies. So that's when a patient is put on a schedule by the doctor. They come in every so often and get a unit of blood taken out of them, and that's to reduce down how much blood cells they have. Because in this disease, there's so many blood cells, it gets really viscous, really thick blood, and we that's not good for the patient. Um, also, all of those red cells are all carrying iron, and it's, it's just, it's too much. So by taking out a unit of blood at a time, it lessens the thickness of viscosity of their blood. It gets some of that down in levels, so it's not so much. 
So here's a picture. This is a 100x view. Um, this would be normally an area of a good area to count cells where the cells should be just beginning to touch each other, but you can notice that it's hard to find that kind of an area when there's so many red blood cells to begin with. They really crowd all over each other and get smushed looking. So this is kind of what it would look like here. Here is in the bone marrow, again, showing panmylosis, so all cell lines are increased. Again, there's no really fat, patchy areas here. It's all pretty much cells. All right, essential thrombocytemia is the next one, otherwise known as ET. Again, this is usually a chronic condition that appears older adults after age 60. The key is the name of it, thrombocytemia. So that word itself should tell you it's all about the platelets. So not only is it um, an increase in platelet count, it's a significant increase in platelet count. Those platelets are usually well above 600, if not around 1,000 or more. So when you get a case study and you see your platelet count saying 1,200, the first thing that pops in my mind is, is this essential thrombocytemia? That's huge. That is such a significant platelet count. Besides the platelets being that high, you will also see that platelets being abnormally bigger in size. They might be giant platelets in their smear, and the granules not, may not look weird. So not only are they overproducing the platelets, they're not nice, healthy platelets to begin with. They're kind of icky platelets. And so as a result, they don't tend to function well. So this person might still be prone to bleeding. Even though they have a ton of platelets, because they don't function, they're still going to be more prone to those bleeding episodes. In the bone marrow, of course, you'd find increased megakaryopoiesis. Megakaryocytes are the cells that produce platelets. So we see an increased number of those kicking out all these platelets. So the key here is differentiating if it's essential thrombocytemia from any other disorder that might have thrombocytosis. There are a lot of disorders out there with high platelet counts. I mean, both CML and polycythemia vera could have high platelet counts. The key, again, is how high of a platelet count is it in the essential thrombocytemia? It's well above 600. And then making sure that there's no other signs of anything else that could be. So again, splenomegaly found here with the patient. And there is what we see in the blood and bone marrow. So when you go down the blood, the big thing here is the increased platelets. And then the function, again, it does not work well. They don't perform right. So we see a decreased platelet function. In the bone marrow, it's pretty much all about the megakaryocytes being increased, producing all those. So here is a picture of a normal area under 100X. Look at all those platelets. Oh my God, can you imagine doing a platelet estimate? Oh, it'd be like, where in the heck was I? <laughs> all right. Oh, and I should say, whoops, no, no, go back. Let's see. Uh, none of these are too giant, but you can see abnormally sized platelets. None of these were. I just want to make sure. And then in the bone marrow, you'll notice the big patchy areas are still present. So the bone marrow isn't overly cellular in this one, but what you do notice is one, two, three, four, at least four megakaryocytes in just this one little zoomed in field alone, which that's an increase in megakaryocytes. Again, megakaryocytes are pretty easy to find because they're the biggest cells in your bone marrow, so they really stand out. All right, and then myelofibrosis with myeloid metaplasia is our last one out of this chapter. Again, it has a couple names. You could just know it as myelofibrosis. If it just says that, it would be good. If it's called chronic idiopathic myelofibrosis, or CIMF for short, that is also another name. So again, a few names here. Chronic condition, again, usually in people over 60, we'll also still see that splenomegaly involved. For lab features, there is definitely an ineffective hematopoiesis going on within this disease. As a result, we do see a hypercellular bone marrow. They're trying to produce some sort of cells that are okay. The key finding is what the name is, myelofibrosis, finding increased amounts of fiber inside that bone marrow. So that would be how to diagnose it if the doctor had a clue that that was what was happening. You would also see increased megakaryocytes in the bone marrow here. And then in the blood, you get a kind of a bunch of different things happening. You're not only going to have immature granulocytes, so you'd have that left shift. Um, so you see the bands, the metamyelocytes. You also see immature red blood cells, what we say normal blasts. So those are the immature red cells. So remember that word with the immature granulocytes and the immature nucleated red cells, 
That is called leukoerythroblastic. Remember, we learned that word recently, leukoerythroblastic. And that's standing for all those immature cells of both granulocyte and red cell nature. We would also see dacryocytes, which are the teardrop-shaped red cells, and then some other bizarre poikilocyte shapes on the blood smear. So again, to diagnose, you're going to see the increase in the bone marrow of three types of collagen being there, so the increase in the three types there. You don't need to remember the three types. I just want you to know that's how we diagnose it. Um, this is also interesting. We're not sure why this happens, but a lot of times with people that do have this disorder, you will see these cells start to be made and accumulating in other organs, not just the bone marrow. We'll see it in the spleen, liver. So all of a sudden, not only is the bone marrow making cells, but all of a sudden the spleen and liver start kicking in too. And that's a possibility. That's always been a possibility, but usually they don't. But in this case, it does happen, and so you might see cells accumulating over there as well. So here's what we see for changes. Um, probably the biggest thing is just some of the bizarre poikilocytes, teardrop-shaped cells that are going to be present. Again, nucleated red cells, immature granulocytes, so that whole leukoerythroblastic thing happening. Your other ones, as far as the white cells, the lap and platelets, none of that really helps you diagnose this. It's more the red cell changes that are happening and the immature grams. The other weird thing is, an you will see actually sometimes you might get a megakaryocyte show up in the blood, which is really unusual. Typically, megakaryocytes can only be in the bone marrow. That should, is where they belong. But sometimes they will come into the bloodstream, and you might see what we call a micro megakaryocyte, which is kind of a smaller version of the normal cell. And so it's very abnormal, but you might see that pop up. In the bone marrow, you can see it's a hypercellular bone marrow, so increased cellularity, increased in the granulocyte production, the megakaryocyte production, and again, the key is the increased myelofibrosis. All right, so here's what it would look like. Isn't it just junky looking? It's such a junky look to this disorder. So let's look at this. You have your weird looking kind of, almost looks like spiky little red cells here, kind of like um, echinocyte looking almost. You have just some other ones here and there. I don't see any really good teardrop-shaped ones in this picture, but you definitely have one, two, at least three nucleated red cells here. So you have one on the very left, like at 8 o'clock, and then you got two a little bit past the center. So you got those three nucleated red cells. You got a couple segs, and then you got to have, there's this big myelocyte it looks like here. So you definitely have a little bit of an immature cell. And then all these other bizarre things that have no nucleus, those are giant platelets. They're huge, oh my gosh. So here's a micro megakaryocyte, and we know this is a micro megakaryocyte because the platelets are coming off that cytoplasm. I know it's hard to tell, um, and you see a lot of platelets because you're gonna see increased platelets here as well. So that is that. The biggest thing you guys are gonna need to do is remember the key characteristics of each one of these four disorders because when you get case study questions on a test, you're going to have to be able to sort out, okay, which one of the four could it be? And if you know the key findings of each one, that is really going to help you. All right, now let's go to our next PowerPoint on myelodysplastic syndrome. So myelodysplastic, otherwise known as MDS for short, these are a group of disorders that basically are characterized by two things. One, they all have cytopenias, meaning there's at least one cell line that is decreased, whether it's the red cell, one of the myeloid like granulocyte lines, or the platelet line. So at least one of those cell lines is decreased. And then the other classic finding is dyspoesis. So at least one cell line or more will have what we call dyspoesis, meaning when they were developed, they were abnormally developed. They're going to have weird features morphology to them that isn't typical and we're going to go through that how different cell lines would look with dyspoesis. These are typically chronic disorders. Again, older adults um, is usually who it affects and then these are going to be similar in that they can progress into an acute leukemia at the end and again the prognosis will go down so we'll see that and talk about that. So why a myelodysplastic syndrome starts? Again, abnormal stem cell. If you have an abnormal myeloid stem cell, any cells that that produces could become very abnormal. So it just depends on what 
part of that stem cell became abnormal and how the rest of the cells are affected. Lots of causes as to why these stem cells become abnormal. It could be exposure to radiation, maybe a virus they had, something in their environment, chemotherapy. Um, again, it's never easy to pinpoint what causes these stem cells all of a sudden to become abnormal. So there's a lot of thoughts here, but nothing like really linked heavily. So within each of the three major myeloid cell lines, so again, the three major myeloid cell lines are the red cell line, the platelet line, and then your granulocyte monocyte lines. In each one of those, they tend to have some sort of dyspoietic feature, and so we're going to go through that. So I already listed the cell lines that stem from the myeloid. So as far as the red cell goes, here, the red cell line will have the following wrong with it from in these diseases. You will see oval macrocytes as a very common finding in a myelodysplastic syndrome. We have only talked about oval macrocytes one other time, and that was with an anemia in hematology one, and that was the megaloblastic anemias. So now you can know oval macrocytes either belong within megaloblastic anemias, or you will see them in myelodysplastic syndrome. Otherwise, we don't see them in anything else. The cells otherwise are going to be tending to be microcytic hypochromic. So you're thinking, okay, I have small cells, microcytic hypochromic cells, but I also have oval macrocytes, which are big. That's where we get what we call a dimorphic red cell population. You're going to have both small cells and big cells. So it's like you have both represented here. Um, in the bone marrow, you're going to see weird nucleus shapes in the red cell precursors as they're trying to get developed. We will definitely see ringed sideroblasts. Remember, a ringed sideroblast is when you have the iron granules circling around that nucleus of the immature red cell trying to get inside of it, because remember, we need iron inside those hemoglobin molecules. And it can't get in, so it's ringing around the outside waiting, and that's what we call ring sideroblast. And we can see that if we were to stain the bone marrow with Prussian blue stain. Remember, Prussian blue is what we use to help stain and look at the amount of iron that we have. So if you were to do that, you would see these iron circling around making these ringed sideroblasts. So that is a key finding within myelodysplastic. All right, so here is a picture of oval macrocytes. Um, again, you'd have to see my cursor. There's one here kind of at 9 o'clock. There's one here a little bit off the center, one right above it. So besides, I mean, you just have to look at the shape. You can tell that they're bigger than the other cells, but they're going to have more of an oval shape, not just round. So that's the difference. Here is the dimorphic red cell population look. So as you look through this picture, you see lots of macrocytes, but you also see lots of microcytes, almost kind of an equal representation of both. So that's what we would term dimorphic. All right, within the myelocytic lines, so basically your neutrophil, basophil, eosinophil lines, you're going to see persistence of basophilia in the cytoplasm of these cells as they mature. So remember, when cells are really young, they have a basophilic cytoplasm, meaning really dark blue. As they mature, they're supposed to lose that coloring and get lighter. Well, in the case in these syndromes, they will keep that dark blue coloring. They'll also have weird granulation, abnormal nucleus shapes. So all of this is just weird looks to the cells that shouldn't normally be happening. So here would be an example of kind of some agranular myeloid cells where they're not really having granules show up as they should. This is an abnormal nucleus shape. You can see there's a hole right in the middle of it. That's really not normal. And then here's the persistent basophilia where you can see it should be a lot lighter of cytoplasm and it's just keeping that dark blue tendencies. And then for the platelet lines, you're gonna see giant platelets, abnormal granulation. Again, you might even see microcaryocytes popping up. In the bone marrow, the megakaryocytes might have abnormal nucleus shapes as well. So here's some abnormal platelet granulation and some larger platelets there as well. All right, so with that being said, all of those are possible changes to the cells that you might see in these diseases. They also don't function normally either then. So they will have an abnormal function. So in the granulocytes, remember the main function of granulocytes is phagocytosis to help eat up anything foreign. Well, they're not going to do very well at that. They're also not going to be very good at responding and sending chemical signals, that chemotaxis that they're supposed to do. Um, so all of that's kind of a poor function. Red cells, 
they don't respond well to reserpoin if as a result we don't make red cells very well and then that's going to lead to an anemia so you definitely see anemia involved in these disorders so because the red cells just aren't going to respond to the reserpoin and make you know and make more platelets they don't perform right so as a result you're prone to bleeding all right, so there is a classification system in place of these myelodysplastic syndromes, since there's an entire group of them. You have, again, FAB and WHO are your two main classification groups. FAB always classifies according to morphology, like what cells are involved. WHO includes morphology, also cytogenetics, immunology, like antibody stuff, molecular stuff, like DNA, you know, so WHO is a lot more scientific and kind of accurate, but in this class, I just find it simpler for us to remember the FAB one. We'll discuss how the WHO has changed different things, but mainly I'm going to ask you to know the five FAB classes, which are listed here. I just find that these are a little bit easier for you to grasp and get to know, and I just in general want you to know what myelodysplastic syndromes are. So the five classes for FAB are refractory anemia, refractory anemia with ring sideroblasts, what we call RARS, refractory anemia with excessive blasts, chronic myelomonocytic leukemia, and refractory anemia with excessive blasts in transformation. So the biggest distinction amongst these is listed here is how many blast cells are involved and any other sort of findings. So this is the slide to know. You have to know every single one of these five and which criteria go with which. So if I were to ask you a test question like, oh, this disorder has less than 1% blast, less than 5% blast in the bone marrow, and less than 15% ring sitter blast, you would know it's refractory anemia. So you have to just get to know these. And I think it's just kind of memorization. So. Before I go too far, the word refractory itself, and there might be a question on a study guide on this, I think, but basically the word itself means resistant to treatment. So refractory means resistant to treatment. So even though it's called refractory anemia and you're thinking, oh, it's just an anemia. No, it's pretty significant. It's a hard anemia to treat. Um, it can progress at any time to an acute leukemia. As you see at the very end of the chart, there's acute leukemia possibility. Any one of these can go into an acute leukemia, and then again, that prognosis is bad. So these are not just simple anemias. They are very much significant disorders, these myelodysplastic. They are hard disorders. They do not have a good survival rate um, at all. So with refractory anemia, the first one, again, it has hardly any blast in the bone marrow or blood. The RF is ring sitter blast, so it has less than 15%, so barely has any ring sitter blast, but it will still have oval macrocytes, and it will still have low cell counts in the light, so cytopenia. Refractory anemia with ring sitter blast, the name itself tells you there should be a lot of ring sitter blast, so the key finding is greater than 15% ring sitter blast in the bone marrow. The next one, refractory anemia with excessive blast, well, it tells you the blast population has increased. You get about 5 to 20 percent blast though in the bone marrow. Not enough to make it an acute, but getting there. Um, next one is refractory anemia with excess blast in transformation. You see the counts pick up even more. You got monocytes really increasing in their production. And then you have chronic myelomonocytic leukemia. As the name tells you, it has lots of monocytes um, involved now. And your blast count is a little bit elevated, 5 to 20. So that's kind of your findings. Again, any one of these can turn into an acute. According to FAB, in order to be considered an acute leukemia, you must be at least 30% or more in the bone marrow of blast. Now that was something that the WHO changed, and that's important for you to remember. The WHO kept many of these, um, oops, I just went the wrong way, sorry. The WHO kept many of these same classification as FAB, so they kept most of it the same. That's why it's okay to learn the FAB one. One of the key items they did change, which you should remember, is they changed the number of blast cells required to be considered an acute leukemia. So FAB has it here that greater than 30% will be considered an acute leukemia. The WHO said, nope, greater than 20% we now consider an acute leukemia. 
So that's a crucial, crucial point that I would keep in mind. The other thing the WHO did is they added two new classes, which are listed there. I'm not going to ask you to remember these. And then they kind of eliminated another category. So that's the major changes that they made. So here's one of the new categories they added. Again, you do not need to know this new category. I'm not going to test you on this one. Um, they also kind of put the refractory anemia with excess blast into two different types, groups. I'm not going to go that far and test you on that. This is just informational here. And then they added a 5Q syndrome based on cytogenetic abnormalities that they were finding. I'm not testing you on that either. So here's an overall look at the WHO classification put into a similar chart as the FAB one. Again, I want you to know the FAB one. We're not going to go with this one. We're just going to keep it simpler. Prognosis, like I said, all of these are very poor prognosis. They're not good survival rates. You can see it can be up to six years, a little bit more, but any point in there, it can progress to an acute leukemia. And when it does, it's usually in 50 to 80% it does, which is significant. It gets less. So the only cure for these myelodysplastic syndromes is to do a bone marrow transplant, and that's if they're young enough, healthy enough, there's all that criteria. Otherwise, you know, you're just giving them supportive therapy. If they get low enough in platelet count, give them some platelets. If they are low enough in red cells, give them some red cells. There's some hormones, some chemotherapy that gets done, whatever they can do to blast those abnormal stem cells to try to get new, healthier ones. So, again, this might be confusing, but basically the key cell chart, or the key PowerPoint slide, I don't like to say cell chart, PowerPoint slide to know is this one. I would know this. I would know this change that the WHO did, making that acute leukemia only needs to be 20% blast to be considered acute leukemia. That is significant. And then I would know some of these key findings that you might see in the different shapes and production of cells. And remember, the other big thing to know is the two criteria to be considered myelodysplastic is you have cytopenia and dyspoiesis. Those are the two big criteria to be considered a myelodysplastic syndrome. So hopefully that kind of put it into a little bit better perspective. So I don't know how to, wait, there it is. Okay. So I, I, that might be confusing, but if you know some of those beginning slides and you know, where is it? This one, you're going to be golden. That's essential. You guys do have a study guide that you'll fill out to help kind of write out this stuff and kind of try to get it in your memory while you're writing it out. Don't just copy paste, but try to type it out to make yourself active with it to help remember it. Otherwise, that is it for this week. Um, if you guys have any questions, as always, please feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, have a fabulous week. Thank you.